Alright, I'm Alex Adair, and this is my video on calorimetry experiments. So before we dive into calorimetry, let's give us some background. Let's start with heat. Heat's a form of energy that causes temperature change. When you light a match, you're not creating heat, you're just stimulating a chemical reaction in order to transfer it into a different form. This displays the first law of thermodynamics. It can be transferred, but never created or destroyed. Therefore, when you transfer it, it causes that temperature change. It's represented by the variable Q. When a substance gains heat, it's called an endothermic reaction, and an exothermic reaction is when it loses its heat. Losing is a negative process, and gaining is positive, so losing and gaining of a solution versus its surroundings can be represented by the equation shown. Specific heat, however, is the amount of energy required to raise the heat of a su substance by one degree Celsius, and that's what we'll use more in calorimetry. Calorimetry in general is a process in which enthalpy, which is the heat transfer between substances in a reaction, is measured. We're going to use a thermometer to measure this energy, this heat transfer. And um, basically, we're going to utilize the relationship between the system, which is going to be the reaction in this, in this experiment, and the surroundings, which is the water, the calorimeter, the apparatus we're going to use, and the outside. Um, water is the most common place for this reaction to happen. And that's because of its high specific heat, which we'll see on the next slide. So the heat for cooling or warming of an object requires three things. How much material there is, what the material is, or its specific heat, and how much the temperature changed. Um, so we're going to measure the temperature change. But because the specific heat is specific to each substance, we can find the substance's identity and other variables experimentally. So basically, you can see on this chart how liquid water has the highest specific heat, and that's what makes it so common to be used in these sorts of experiments. All right, so our calorimeter is what we're going to use to measure it. It's going to be made of two styrofoam cups with a lid and a stopper and a stirrer, and the thermometer, obviously, to measure this temperature. The reason we have two styrofoam cups and we have to keep the lid on and stop it is to reduce the heat loss between the solution and the outside. Then we can measure accurately what's happening within the cup, the reaction. We also need to keep the pressure constant because only in a constant pressure state can the enthalpy be measured, even though we can't keep the, we can't keep the heat lost completely, we can keep the pressure constant. So, Let's ensure that the apparatus is properly set up before we actually do the experiment so that this minimal heat escapes. Um, then we have to calibrate the calorimeter to account for the lost heat that inevitably has to escape. Then we use that constant that we find after calibration and we factor that into our final equations. Then we're gonna start stirring the, the mixture but not include the reactants yet. We have to take our initial temperature without adding the reactants. Then when we add the reactants, we have to keep measuring the temperature. And then even after the temperature even, evens out, we have to ensure that it's accurate by measuring it farther for a longer time. Then we're going to graph our experimental data and determine the temperature change over the time before we added the reactants and after. And we're going to use this temperature change in the enthalpy and the heat change equation to determine other variables within the formula. That is the steps of the experiment. And it's relatively easy to, easy to carry out as long as you remember these tips. You have to keep the thermometer in the same place the entire time so that it doesn't touch the styrofoam cup or get somehow out of the solution and, and the water and not measure anything. You also have to try to keep the lid on the cal calorimeter almost the entire time. You can look at the reaction because you need to take some observations, but only for a few seconds. You have to keep the stir bar the same setting so that it doesn't stir too fast and make the entire thing fall over or create a higher temperature than you had before based on just the stirring friction than the actual reaction. You have to make sure that you measure all the reactants evenly so that you're creating the correct conditions for the experiment and your results are accurate. And you also have to perform it multiple times like most experiments to find accurate result results as well. All right, so the real life and experimental uses of this are pretty broad. You can find the specific heat, which I've already talked about, revealing the identity of the substance. Um, you can also find the mass of a substance, because that's another variable, if you know the specific heat. Um, you can also measure the thermal energy or the calorie content in foods, which is really useful in the food industry. Um, and you can also help verify the safety of manufactured drugs, because the energy transferred also relates to the st stability of the drug and how much the drug can handle can really affect us. And also bomb calorimetry, which is a different sort of calorimetry involving gas 
and the specific heats of gases, which is really hard to do in a lab like we can do at home. Um, but in this sort of situation, you can measure things like coal and fuel and like things like that that would emit sorts of fumes and gases when they um, combust and things like that. Okay, um, so thank you for watching. And I did a bunch of memes in this just because uh, my teacher just said to make it fun. And I thought that like kind of mocking whatever, whatever science teachers decide to put a bunch of memes up there. It's kind of fun. I don't know. Okay. Thanks guys. I hope you have a nice